Turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. As a reminder, Scott preached two Sundays ago on the beginning of the story of the rich young ruler. And because we went out of order, I told Scott I was going to review some of the stuff he covered already and, and say some similar things to what he said just two weeks ago, just to keep it fresh in our mind so we can sort of have the flow of thought of what is happening in this story. So Matthew chapter 19. I'll start at the beginning of Scott's text from two weeks ago. I'll read through t- today's passage. So I'll start in verse 13. I'll read to the end of the chapter. This is Matthew 19, starting in verse 13. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Matthew 19, verse 13. Then children were, were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, In the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you who have followed Me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands for My name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, again, what is written in this passage, what needs to happen in all of our hearts is something that Jesus declares to be impossible with man. And so, God, we need Your work. I so appreciate what we've already sung in this service, that we come to You in weakness, and what Scott just shared from 1 Samuel, bringing our sorrow, our weakness, our anxiety, our fear into Your presence with prayer because we know that only You can do what we need done in our lives. Only You can give us satisfaction and forgiveness, and only You can stabilize us in the midst of a very uncertain life with many trials, many ups and downs. So, God, do that work now. Do the impossible. What is impossible with man is only possible with God. So, God, do that work in our hearts, and we we pray that right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, my first point, I'm going to be somewhat just recapping things Scott said two weeks ago, uh, but I'll give you the three points for those who want to jot this down. They're very short uh, points. Number one is self-righteousness. Self-righteousness, that's verses 16 to 22. Point two is worldly riches. Worldly riches, verses 23 to 26. And then point number three is eternal reward verses 27 to 30, eternal reward, verses 27 to 30. So let's begin back with where Scott was two weeks ago. Let me again just read part of this all over again. Verse 16, we'll we'll sort of break this down into some pieces. Verse 16, and behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Let's just start here. 
you know this uh, probably, I hope, but certainly, probably, one of the wide, most widespread false beliefs about God, religion in general, is the idea that what happens? Basically good people, if they work hard and try hard, no one's perfect, but if basically good people, decent people, work hard with their lives, give it their best shot, at the end of the day, people might even say, if there's a God at all, surely when I die and appear before Him, He will realize that I was flawed, but He will certainly have grace and compassion on me. He will certainly forgive and accept me because I worked hard. I tried my best with what I had. I didn't commit some major crime, and, uh, you know, I, I, gave him the, I gave it my best shot. And I think many people feel deep down like they basically are good, but I think also everyone knows that they are not measuring up to some standard that is written within their own conscience. And so there's this inner turmoil between a kind of self-satisfied self-righteousness, which I think we're all born with from birth. We, we just kind of have this basic sense that I'm a decent person. Most of us sort of grow up feeling that way, not everybody, but a lot of us have that inherent sense of self-righteousness. I had it growing up. Yet at the same time, there's often mixed with it a kind of insecurity. And do we not see both of those things present in this young man, the rich young ruler, right? He was young. I mean, the word used for young, one commentator said, could describe a young man between the ages of 21 and 28. So, th think of a guy in his mid-20s who has done extremely well for himself in a very short time. It seems like the word used may incorporate property. So, this man owned a lot of property, which was very valuable, especially in that day and age. He had done very well for himself, a rich young ruler. And so, this man who's also probably got a very good public image, right? He's got a lot of wealth. He's got some power, right, some prestige at a young age, and he's also probably outwardly a moral person, a decent person. He probably was thought well of by people around him, right? So, so that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the man here, and he also, though, is marked by a kind of insecurity because he's asking Jesus, something's missing, he seems to be saying. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And later, uh, he will say, um, all these I've kept, but what do I still lack? It seems as though there's something in his own conscience that's telling him, even though he's tried his best and he thinks of himself as basically there, does he feel like something's not quite right? Yeah, deep down inside, he, he knows something is lacking, something is missing. So, so maybe that's you. Maybe you say, okay, a decent person, I, I work hard, I try hard, I try to be a, a good person. But maybe you feel deep down like something is lacking, something's not really there, something is not quite, quite, quite clicking, and this person brings his question to Jesus. And Jesus says something that Scott said we would probably never say to someone who was showing interest in the Christian faith. And I, I think Scott's right about that. Let's look at what Jesus said again, verse 17. He said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, believe in me. No, he doesn't say that. If you would enter life, what does he say? keep the commandments. And as Scott pointed out, I think what Jesus is doing here is actually brilliant. What's He saying? Now, let me, let me just give kind of a, a word here. For maybe, maybe this is you or maybe it's someone you know. Okay? Maybe it's a family member, a friend, someone you know who, uh, not a believer, but they, they, they think of themselves as a good person deep down. And, and, and they're, they're wrestling with that. I would say if someone is struggling with that kind of legalism, right, that's a, that's a church word. Legalism just means I am basing my relationship with God on my ability to perform according to His law. So, so the better I think I'm doing, the, the better I feel like I've got a right standing with God because I'm trying hard, and the more I sin and fail, I feel like I don't have a right standing. That's a legalist, okay? That's what the Pharisees had a, a, a kind of view along those lines. What do you say to someone who is struggling with real legalism, thinking profoundly that they are good enough for God, that they are acceptable before God based on their own performance. What do you say? And Jesus teaches us right now, they don't need immediately just to be given a message perhaps of Jesus down on the cross. We need to get to that soon. But what do they need first is to realize they need someone to die on the cross, right? They don't think they need that. And so what Jesus gives them first is, okay, for all the legalists out there, whether that's you or someone you know, here's what legalists need. Legalists need not less law, they need more law. Because any legalist who thinks that they're basically keeping the law doesn't understand what the law is saying. So if you think you're basically, I've read the Bible, I know the Ten Commandments, I'm, I'm pretty good on that. I saw on a, on a TV show, it was a clip that someone clipped out on a well-known TV show. I'll tell you what it was. It was The View. We're, we're, okay, on The View. Someone said to one of the co-hosts, they said on The View, they said, how are you doing like in terms of being a good person? And the other person who you would know their, this, this lady's name, she said, oh, I'm a good person. Like, I, I'm definitely a good person. And she said, well, what about the Ten Commandments? Okay, this person, the lady being interviewed was a Christian, and she's talking to the host who's, uh, the, the, one of the co-hosts who's not a believer. And she says, well, how about this one? You shouldn't lie. 
And she goes, is that one of the commandments? Uh Uh-oh, I'm in trouble now, is what the lady said. It took her about four seconds to realize, "Uh uh-oh, if those are the commandments, I'm in big trouble. So God has given us the law in its first instance to humble men and women. That's why God's law is in the Bible in its first instance, to show you you can't keep it, you haven't kept it properly, you fall far short of keeping God's law properly. So Jesus, when this guy comes up and says, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus says, first of all, you don't know what the word good means, and you don't really understand what the law says, right? That's what he's saying. He's questioning his understanding of goodness. Your standard is way too low. There's only one who is good, the triune God, right? There's only one who is good. No other human measures up to God's standard. So number one, he has a way too low view of good. And number two, he thinks he's keeping God's commandments just right. And so Jesus tests him. Let's read it again. Verse uh, 18, Jesus said to him, which one, or excuse me, he said to Jesus, which ones? And Jesus said, so he starts with commandment number six, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall shall not bear false witness. And he goes backwards to commandment five, honor your father and mother. Then he jumps out of the Ten Commandments, goes to Leviticus 19 and says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So that, that just summarizes all the rest of the law, right? Love your neighbor as yourself just summarizes all the don't cheat, don't steal, don't commit adultery. All those things are underneath that banner of love God and love people. So verse 20, the rich young man is unfazed, which It almost puts a smile on your face in sort of a sad sort of way. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? And so as Scott pointed out, what does Jesus do? He drills down, you could argue it's the first commandment, it's the 10th commandment, right? Have no other gods before me, don't covet. Paul says in Colossians, coveting is idolatry. So Paul says the first commandment and the last commandment are almost the same thing, because if you love something more than you should, you're making it into an idol, right? So you're, you're, he, Jesus pushes in on those first and last commandments and says, how are you doing on idolatry? And he goes, let me, let me test you, rich young man. Let me say here, Jesus doesn't give this command to every Christian to give away all that you have. We should be willing to give up anything Jesus would ask us to give up. That's certainly true. Whatever we are called to give up in, the, in, the, in obedience, we must be willing to part with He'll mention in a second, fathers, mothers, houses, children. Now, there's a lot of things we're going to be asked, perhaps, to give up if, if, if Christ calls. But Jesus says to him what? He, he narrows in on that one command. And look at this, verse 21. Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, that is, if you would be completely devoted to the Lord, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So Jesus, after testing him with the law, this man, it just goes right over him, right? Like he thinks, just just think about this, honor your father and mother. He probably is thinking very superficially, like I haven't cursed at them in public or something, and I haven't, he's thinking like very like superficially, he's like, yeah, I've, I've kept that command. And Jesus is thinking, Really? (laughs) You mean every thought, attitude, action, and word you've ever had about or towards your parents has been completely honorable and respectful? Yeah, that's true of no people, right? No one can say that that is true of them. And you can do that with adultery and on and on, right? When you drill these commandments down into the heart level, maybe I haven't committed murder. Have I gossiped and slandered against someone who who I absolutely should not have done because I was angry at them in some personal moment and I slandered their name to make them look bad? Is that not the seed form of murder. Jesus says hatred of the heart is murder in seed form. And if you let that blossom, it becomes actual homicide. But you don't have to commit actual homicide to violate this commandment because it's about loving your neighbor, not hating your neighbor. And on it goes. So Jesus narrows in here on that first commandment, have no other gods before me. And he says, young man, you are very wealthy. And this is what I think Jesus is saying to him. Your wealth is promising you many things, and you're relying on your wealth to give you what only you should be relying on God to give you. Talk about this more in my next point, but I'll just say now, wealth, and you know this, whether you consider yourself wealthy or not, most people don't consider themselves wealthy, but compared to most of the world and most of history, we're wealthy. And and when you think about wealth, it promises to give you security, right? When, When hard times come, inflation's on the rise, economic troubles are happening, you know, everything's up, right? Every price for everything is up, The more you have, the less startled you are by economic instability. The the more you, I I can handle this. I can just write a check. I can pull out my credit card. I'm going to be fine. No matter what happens, I'm not going to have to struggle with the bills because I've got wealth. It promises security. Money also promises a kind of prestige. 
I mean, just, just you, you know this, right? When someone who is really wealthy, like just like extremely wealthy walks into a room, you sort of, you, you're aware, right? You're like, wow, that person's here. I mean, it, it does something. It gives you a kind of a, a, kind of a sense of, of, of identity. It gives you a sense of pleasure. It, it promises to unlock every door of worldly pleasure because you can buy it, right? Whatever you want that could offer you some pleasure or meaning or satisfaction, money promises to give you the key to everything the world has to offer. It's extremely alluring. It's extremely dangerous. Jesus called it, remember, unrighteous mammon in Luke 16, unrighteous mammon, because money, although it's not inherently wrong and it's a necessary evil, we have to use it, we have to make it, we have to spend it, we, got, we, we need to give it generously, but money has a gravitational pull towards worldliness. And Jesus warns us more about money and greed and materialism more than just about any other sin because he knows it's so subtle, it is so crafty, and it can tend to grab around our heart. Remember the parable of the soils from a few months, I don't know how long ago it was, a while back, the parable of the soils? Remember Jesus said, there is some seed that falls along the thorny soil, and it sprouts up, but before it produces fruit, the thorns come in, wrap around, and choke out that plant, it never produces fruit. And what are we told the thorns are? They are the cares, anxieties, and riches of this age. See, those things subtly, like, like think about weeds and thorns growing up slowly around this plant. It's saying, be distracted by this. This really matters over here. And it gets your heart and your mind invested in the things of this life and this age because it gets exciting and interesting and there's some anxiety and some, all, all these things. And you, you lean in. And the further you lean in, you may not see it. It may take a decade before you wake up one morning and realize what's been going on in your heart subtly with work or with money or whatever for the last decade of your life. But you may wake up one morning and realize, I haven't had a truly spiritual moment with the Lord in months because I've been so entangled by the cares, anxieties, concerns, and riches of this life. And this rich young ruler right now, he looks like he's on the verge of conversion. He looks so promising. If you were standing in front of him, you'd go, hey, this, this guy's about to become a Christian. He is begging Jesus for the most important question, how do I get eternal life? He's on the precipice of the kingdom, and yet he walks away from Jesus, downcast and depressed and saddened. Why? Why? Because the cares, riches, and concerns of this life, in his short life, in his mid-twenties, were wrapped around his heart in such a way that when he had to be forced to choose between Jesus and his money, he couldn't let go of his money. Jesus did not offer him in that moment actual satisfaction that exceeded worldliness. The world was just way more meaningful, securing, satisfying, interesting than Christ. And so emotionally, his affections couldn't do it. Jesus is going to say it's actually impossible for our affections to change without the Holy Spirit doing a work in just a moment. So this man is trapped inside of his worldliness. He's trapped inside of his love of money. And when push comes to shove, he says, I can't give this up. It is my identity. It's my security. It's my satisfaction. It's my key to all this world gives. I can't give it up. There's an, there's an old illustration. I don't remember what kind of monkey this is. There's some kind of monkey or something. I don't remember, I don't remember how it goes. But there's, I, I read this years ago. I think it's a monkey of some kind. Someone can fact check me on this later. There's some kind of monkey where they, they, if they have a little hole in the ground uh, where the monkey, you've probably heard of this, the monkey can barely slide his hand through this hole and there's like a little pocket inside and they put some kind of nut or acorn, or, you know, some kind of thing that this monkey wants to get. So the monkey kind of slips, slip, he barely gets his hand through this hole and then he grabs the acorn or whatever's in there and all of a sudden, he's trapped. And there's people who catch these particular animals, and they catch them like this. And, and they, they have this, this monkey's caught there, and the monkey sees the, the catcher coming, and the monkey starts freaking out. Okay, the monkey's like doing what a monkey would do in this situation. He's completely losing the, his mind, and he, he's not getting away. And the trapper walks up and puts the net over him or whatever he does and catches this thing. Well, how does this work? You, you think, how crazy could you be? All he has to do is let go and he's free, right? He's gone. He can get away from this terrible uh, person coming to trap him. He's, I, I can get out of here right now. Well, it's a, it's a funny story. I've actually seen a video, I believe, of something like this happening years ago. I can't remember it clearly, but I've seen it before. And here's, here's, the, here's the point. This rich young ruler is as free in Christ as he wants to be. He's reached his hand into worldliness, and he's grabbed onto something. He's gotten something really good by worldly standards at a really young age. He's very successful. And Jesus comes and says, you can have me. You, you, you can get away from this, this slavery to this worldliness, and you can have me. And he says, I'm unwilling. 
He will not open his hand and drop what's in his hand, which is the money, which Scott said last time, would drop on the poor, right? He opens his hand, his heart drops money on the poor, which is where it should go, and then his hand is supposed to be what? Full of Christ. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. One thing you lacked, if you want to be perfect, drop what you're finding your worth in, drop it, you'll be free, and come and follow me. Grab hold of me, and I will give you far beyond anything you would lose as far as your wealth uh, is offering but he walks away sorrowful. Now, point number two of the sermon, worldly riches. I'm just going to pick up with the point we're already making, worldly riches, verses 23 to 26. Verse 23, and Jesus said to his disciples, so that man has just walked away, sad. Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? I'll just stop there. First thing, I just want to mention this. The the disciples are astonished because in their mindset, the Lord gives riches, which is true, but they saw it as a sign of God's blessing on someone's life. Think of, I'm not saying the disciples are Job's friends, but think about Job's friends. They saw, no doubt, his success with his animals and all that he had as God's blessing, and it was God's blessing. But when it was taken away, what did they think? It's God's judgment. You must have done something wrong. So, in, in the disciples' minds, they're probably thinking similarly in some ways. If, you, if God has blessed you with riches, that is a sign that God is prospering you. That's a sign that you're in a good place spiritually. And Jesus says, with great difficulty can those people be saved, rich people be saved. They're confused. Now, let, let me just mention the camel going through the eye of a needle. There, there's been some cu- confusion about what this means, and um, somebody in church history said, and you've probably heard this, that there was a gate in Jerusalem known as the needle gate, and a person would get off his camel, and the camel would get down on its knees, and it would sort of shimmy very slowly through the needle gate and get into Jerusalem. Now, I want to I tell you, and I've looked at n- numerous very reliable people on this, there is I hate to say this, no evidence, no, no evidence that this was a thing. Uh, th- th- there was something late, centuries later that may have actually been named after Jesus' statement that was developed later, but there's no evidence at all that at the time of Christ there was a needle gate in the dr- wall of Jerusalem. And there's just no evidence for that. that. I think that's a misinterpretation. Because if that was what Jesus was saying, the point would be this. It's hard but possible for the rich to enter the kingdom. You got to get off your camel, get the camel down low, and you can get, you can get through. It's just hard. But that's not Jesus' point. Jesus' point is not that it's hard. I know, I, know, I know he says the word difficult, but then he explains what he means by difficult, and he says what? With man, it's impossible. So Jesus is talking about an actual camel going through an actual needle's eye, like as if you're, you're sewing with a needle, like a tiny eye. So th- there was apparently in the Babylonian Talmud or something like this back around the same time period, they used the phrase an elephant going through the eye of a needle, okay? Well, it, where Jesus is living and teaching, they didn't have a lot of elephants, but they had a lot of, you guessed it, camels. And so Jesus says, okay, what's the smallest space I can think of in the domestic house? It's the eye of a needle. What's the largest animal in, the, in this area of Israel that you see commonly? It's a camel. And so just like Jesus says in another time in Matthew says, you know, they strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. Not literal, right? But he's just making a point. So here he uses camels as a metaphor and says, listen, here's how hard it is for a rich person to stop loving and relying on their wealth and to start loving and relying on the triune God. Here's how hard it is. Uh, It's like a camel going through a needle's eye. It's impossible. It's It's not hard. It's impossible with man. That's the point I believe Jesus is making. And the disciples, of course, are absolutely astonished. Let me just say here, I'm not hating on wealth. But, but let me just say, I mean, this, this is something I heard Piper say years ago. It's not wrong to make money. It's not wrong even to make a lot of money if done justly. It's not wrong, therefore, once you have money, to give generously and to help people in many ways. I mean, people who have a lot of wealth can bless people in amazing ways, right? Can help people in all kinds of ways. I am not saying it is a sin to be rich. But here is something to think about. Our world, whether we admit it or not, we know our world is obsessed and preoccupied with money and wealth. It's just obsessed with it. And Jesus is saying, the more you accumulate in this life, the more tempting it's going to be to turn the wrong direction in regards to Him and money. And so just be aware of this. Money is not inherently evil, but it creates life difficulties because it's very easy for it to become the thorn that chokes out spiritual life. Just be aware that the thing we are so often craving is actually destructive if we make it a God in our life. 
So, verse 26. So they say, who then can be saved? Not just the rich. Who, if the rich can't be saved, who in the whole world can be saved? This, he opens up, they open up to anybody in verse 25, verse 26. Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. To be born again, to be, to be a genuine believer, means that God has done a work in your heart where you used to rely on, it, for you it may not be money, right? I mean, you could list a whole, we, we, we do the list a lot of idols. At least familiar, if you're not familiar, you probably have heard these. Money is an obvious possible God substitute, right? You rely on it for security, pleasure, worth, purpose. But other things could be physical attractiveness, athletic accomplishment and ability, how your children turn out right? Your marriage, uh, your work, your career. There are a thousand things that we could look to to try to find stability, security, purpose, and worth. And Jesus is saying true conversion, true Christianity is not, and I, we hear this, I hear this, I've heard it my entire life. I'll probably continue hearing it my whole life. I try not to just be mean, I, I, you know, in a conversation sometimes you can't, you don't want to just be a nitpick, okay? But I hear people say stuff like this regularly throughout my life. They'll say things like this, you know, I, I prayed to receive Christ when I was seven years old, and I made Him my Savior. And then when I was 17, He became my Lord, and I really started to live for Him. And, and I, I just, I'm thinking, if that's true, you, He wasn't your Savior at age seven. If that's true, that you were not submitted to His Lordship until age 16, you became a Christian at age 16. That's how I would understand that, because your heart change happened with evidence of transformed life and fruit. That is the sign of conversion. And so, Jesus is saying here, listen, the thing that you need, the thing that we all need desperately is something we are not innately born with, which is the ability to look to Christ for our joy, forgiveness, security, purpose, all those things. To find that in Christ is not something mankind is naturally capable of doing just by gritting our teeth and making a decision. This is something that God does by His Spirit. And listen, if, if, if it has not happened to you or someone you love, what do we do? We plead with God, and what do we say? We say, open the eyes of my heart that I might see that your kingdom is a treasure hidden in a field which a man found, covered up, and then from joy went and did what? Sold every worldly thing he had and came back with joy and bought the field so he could get the treasure of Christ in his kingdom. So that is not what this rich young ruler did, right? He saw the treasure and said, that's not as good as what I've already got. I'm leaving without you. But that, that, that ability to see Christ as more satisfying than anything else is impossible with man, but it is possible with God. So, if it's happened to you, I hope it's happened to, 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 to all of us in this room. If that's happened to you, we have to give credit to God for the fact that we can see Him as that treasure for whom we can give away all to know Him. Let me quote um, Paul. Paul says in Philippians, as to the law, a Pharisee he was, as to righteousness under the law, blameless, listen to the language, but whatever gain I had, Think about the rich young ruler with all of his stuff. Whatever gain I had, Paul says, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth, the surpassing value, think treasure, of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, refuse, in order that I might gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Let me also read one other text from 1 Timothy. In fact, let's turn to that. Hold your spot here real quick and turn with me to your right to 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is one of Paul's last letters before he would be put to death for his faith in Rome in the 60, late 60s AD. So this would have been written earlier in that decade. 1 Timothy chapter 6, he, he first rebukes false teachers who look to the ministry as a means of making material wealth and gain, and he rebukes that. And then he says in verse 6, this is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, listen to these incredibly strong words. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, 
into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Now, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to preach a mini-sermon within the sermon. This is very short, okay, very short. This is, this is from Piper, three points from this text, just real quick to e- extrapolate on wealth. Three things from this text, very briefly. Number one is about contentment. Look at verses six and seven. Godliness with contentment is grain, for we brought nothing into the world. We can't take anything out of the world. Here's point number one. Why find your identity and worth in wealth when you were not born, you're not born with wealth. You might be born to a rich family. You're not born personally wealthy. And when you die, guess what? All your worldly wealth is going to be left behind, right? The the statement, you've heard it before. There are no U-Hauls behind hearses. You've heard that before, right? There are no U-Hauls behind hearses. Uh, That's not a thing. So whatever we accumulate in this world, we should use it to bless others, and we should use it for the sake of God's kingdom, and we should use it well, because that will invest in heavenly rewards. But if we just invest in something for its own sake in this life, guess what? One day, you're not going to be here to enjoy it anymore. So whatever we we have in this life, if it's not for the kingdom of God, one day it's going to be gone. It's going to be taken from our hands. Number two, Verse 8, if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Paul says here, we should be content with even meager circumstantial blessings. Paul says, I know how to be abased, brought low. I know how to abound. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He says, I know how when, when I am prospering materially, I can rejoice and thank God for that. But when I am in a prison cell and I haven't been fed for several days and I'm hungry and I've got sleepless nights, I'm going to rejoice in that. When I was in the prison in Philippi, he's singing hymns. Because Paul knows how to rejoice when things are good. He knows how to rejoice when things are bad. But Paul says, listen, if you've got God... You don't need incredibly exuberant, elaborate physical wealth to be content. You've got all you need for contentment in Christ. Don't crave for contentment in other places. It's going to elude you. It's not going to work. And then the third point from this text is what a love of wealth does to us. Verse 9, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires, harmful desires, that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So here's what Paul says. Listen, Paul's Paul's not against your happiness when he says don't love money. He would be against your happiness if he said go love money. Because if you go try to love money and worldly things, you you go after that stuff with a vengeance, guess what it does? It consumes your thinking. It makes you anxious. It makes you worry about a hundred extra things. And suddenly, once you get it, it begins to do what? It controls you. It's all you can think about. You're trying to work stuff out. You're trying to figure out what you're going to do with this and this and this. And all all these things start to clutter in and fill our vision and get us away from God. And he says, at the end of the day, this passion for worldly things leads us away from the faith and it pierces people with many pangs. So don't go there. It's not going to end well. Paul's not robbing you of joy. He's trying to save you for joy in Christ. All right, let's turn back to Matthew 19. We'll move to our last point, eternal reward. Eternal reward. Now, we we know, especially at this point, we know to love Peter, don't we? Because Peter just says whatever he is thinking and uh, I'm still not quite sure to, to make, what to make of Peter's comment here, but it seems to have a little bit of self-pity or some kind of self-congratulatory feel to it. You tell me what you think. So Jesus says, you know what? It's impossible for the rich to, to enter the kingdom. Peter says this, verse 27. Then Peter said a reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? So I, I, what do you make of that statement? I'm not sure what to make of that. I think there might be a little bit of uh, self-congratulations like, hey, Jesus, we did the impossible. Like you, you said, people can't, well, we gave up our whole fishing business right, for you, Jesus, and Matthew gave up his tax collector booth. I mean, we've done some pretty impressive stuff. I don't, I don't know if that's exactly what Peter's saying, but it doesn't seem to be quite right, Peter's question here. It's like, Jesus, we did it, the impossible, we did it. We gave up everything for you. What, are we, what, what do we get out of this deal? You know, what's, our, what's our reward? And Jesus takes him at face value and gives him his, the answer, verse 28. This is an amazing answer, and I, I, I'm not sure I am competent to fully unpack part of what he says here, but verse 28, Jesus said to them, Truly, I say to you, in the new world, literally in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you who have followed Me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. I'll just say here, 
I'm, I'm probably not even going to take the time right now to get into all the possible views of what this verse means. Uh, I'm sorry if that disappoints you. Maybe on another day we could talk about it. There's a whole bunch of views, and I'm not even sure which one I personally think is the most likely. So I'm not even going to go into this much. I'm just going to say this, the easy part. Okay, let me, isn't that nice when you just leave the hard part out of the sermon and just go, let me give you the easy part. Whatever exactly is being referred to here, and there's a lot of different options. You can look at commentaries. I'm not sure which one's right, but here's, here's what we know. Jesus is saying Christians are going to be involved in final judgment right? So, 1 Corinthians 6, you're going to judge angels. How much more so matters of this life, he says. So, I mean, we're going to have a, in Revelation, it speaks of sitting on the throne with Christ. It almost sounds blasphemous. We're sitting on the throne with Christ. I mean, this is unbelievably elevated language for fallen humanity saved in Christ. That's you and me. And yet, Jesus says, listen, the day is coming, whatever you've given up, you're going to be sitting on thrones next to the Lord Jesus, judging, in this case, judging Israel, right? You're going to be involved in things that are far beyond your pay grade, right? Far beyond anything you are worthy of in yourself. But Christ has so elevated us in Himself that we're going to be involved in things that are beyond the imagination. And then He says this, verse 29, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold, Mark adds, in this life, right? A hundredfold in this life and will inherit eternal life in the age to come. But many who are first will be last and the last first. A couple quick things here before we move to communion. Number one is this. That word regeneration in verse 28 in the new world or in the regeneration, that word, it's a fancy Greek word. It's only used twice in the New Testament. Let me just tell you what the two are. This is the one here. The other time it is used is in uh, Titus chapter 3, and this is, the, this is the verse, a great verse, Titus 3, 5. God saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, same word, with, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So that word, that fancy word in Greek, is used twice. Number one, it is used to describe your conversion. So when you are born again, you are a new creation in Christ. The new creation has begun in you. The, the, the renewal has begun in you. you. You're born again to a living hope. Number two, Jesus says also, there is going to be a final renewal of the cosmos, right? And Romans 8, Greg and I talked about this the other day on the phone. Romans 8 talks about what? It talks about how we've been adopted, yet we have not fully been adopted. We've been redeemed, but we haven't yet been fully redeemed. And we await our adoption. We await our redemption, the, the, the redemption of our bodies. Why? Because God has saved us. He has justified and adopted us and redeemed us, but the fullness of that has not been fully revealed. One day it will be fully revealed and the whole creation will be renewed with, uh, with God's people. And so Jesus here is focusing on the, the future here. And he says, listen, you are going to be involved in the renewal of the world, and you're going to receive a hundred times in this life whatever you lose, and in the new creation, you're going to receive eternal life forever with Christ. The point being this, if, if, if someone converts out of another religion, and in this religion, the people, and there's numerous religions you can list here, they cut the person off from the family. They say, because you've been baptized as a Christian, I no longer am going to associate with you as my son or daughter. You, you're cut out of the family. You're no longer part of our family. We reject you from our home. You've just lost father and mother and brother and sister. And guess what? As you are, as you are baptized and join a local church, you receive a hundred mothers. You receive a hundred fathers. You receive hundreds of brothers and sisters in Christ in this new church. That's what I think Jesus is saying. Whatever we have to give up and however painful it may be, you're going to receive a hundredfold in this life, in the church in particular, but in the age to come, eternal life. And so at the end of the day, when you put everything this world has to offer right here, let, let me just, let's, let's all test our own hearts here right in this moment, okay? Imagine on, the, on this side of the stage, you've got everything this world has to offer. Whatever sin you struggle with, right? Whatever thing you are prone to make an idol out of is over here as much of it as you want for as long as you live. The treasures of this life are all put on the, on the scale on this side over here. And you can just picture whatever you, you are tempted to idolize. You've got as much of it as you want forever right here. On the other side of the scale is Jesus, right? It's the gospel. It's the Bible. It's eternal life in Christ. It's, it's all on this side. For you personally, in your own heart of hearts, when you look at that honestly, not what you say in Sunday school, right? Not what you write on a, on a sheet of paper to pass some sort of quiz or something, in a Bible class, in your heart of hearts right now, would, would you say, no question about it? I'll, I'll go with Paul and say, this is rubbish, the refuse. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abandon all that stuff if I have to, to have what's on this side over here, to have Christ. Or if you're saying in your heart of hearts, no, you know, deep down, this is what I'm living for. I mean, Jesus, yeah, I get it, but this is where life is to be found over here. W which is it for you? 
And, and if you say, honestly, I'm struggling with this side of the stage, this is where I'm leaning, I would say right now, in this moment, you can have new life in Christ right now. All you have to do is let go of what has your heart. If it's not Christ, you can just let go. You release it. You say, I'm no longer going to find my worth, my identity in that thing. I'm letting it go. And you're going to be free of a life of slavery to worldliness. And you turn around and you say, I'm going to take Christ. And you receive him. He is living water. He is the living bread. He will satisfy you right now. He will satisfy you fully. He will satisfy you forever. And he will satisfy you freely because he paid the price on the cross to take away all your sin to give you perfect righteousness that He gives you, like His coat of many colors, that He clothes you in His own righteousness. And you can stand faultless, sinless, positively righteous in the righteousness of Jesus on that final day before the Father. In all of His holiness, you will not be consumed. You will not be damned. You will not be sent to hell. That will not happen because you are, you are holy and accepted in the Beloved. And on that day, you will have eternal riches, eternal righteousness, and eternal joy that will await you in the renewal of all things, the regeneration of this whole world because of what Christ has done for us. So on this note, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we move into communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me read in verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Whoever therefore, here's the warning, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are walking, uh, not, none of us are perfect, but if you're, if you're avoiding walking in unrepentant sin and you are walking uh, in, in obedience to Him, not perfectly but truly walking in obedience to Him, and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, we would ask you after I'm done praying to come forward, partake of these elements, and return to your seat. If you do not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ, I would say stay where you are, do not partake of the elements. But deal with the Lord, even where you're sitting in your own seat. Talk to the Lord about what's going on in your heart. Much as Hannah did when she prayed and brought her struggle before the Lord in the temple so many years ago, bring your struggle. If, if you're struggling with the Lord, talk to Him about that. Plead, plead that before the Lord and ask Him for new eyes and a new heart. Ask Him to do what only He can do through the powerful gospel message. So let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, if we are honest, every single person in this room struggles, at times perhaps more than others, with forms of worldliness. It may not be money directly, but it may be the pleasures of this world, which are so alluring and deceptive and inviting. They promise to give us so much, and the return is so little. Lord, if we find ourselves disproportionately, inordinately consumed by love of worldly things, eaten up by it, enslaved by it, worrying about it, constantly tallying and looking at it, and never being able to rest in Christ. God, help us to let go. Help us to repent. Help us to turn to the Lord Jesus, in whom are all the riches of wisdom and knowledge. Everything we could ever desire in holiness is found in Christ. Everything we could ever want is found in Him, the maker of all things. God, help us to have eyes to see the sham and lie of this world. All that glitters and shines is deceptive here. Take the shine away in our eyes. Help us to see it for what it is and help us to see Christ not as a boring historical figure, not as just the leader of some well-known religion. Help us to see Him as the living Savior, the resurrected King, the one who will forgive all who come to Him and will be patient toward those who know Him. 
So God, be with us now as we come forward to partake of these elements. Help us to come forward with repentance in our hearts and joy over what you've done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.